Hey, welcome to Black Gumbo Southern Gardening. It's question and answer episode 15. So as you can see, there's a lot of stuff growing out here in the middle of January. And when people see my garden, oftentimes they have questions and they wanna, they wanna ask, ask me things in the comment section. Well, I'll try to answer you. But I harvest some of the good comments, the, the ones I think I can answer, and I put them in these Q&As. They're not long enough to warrant a, a single video because the answer is brief, but they are good questions. And so if you're interested in, in these kind of questions and answer sessions, I've got a whole playlist of them you can check. And there's 14 episodes there now. After I upload this one, this is number 15. And we're just going to keep doing these about once a month. I hope they're helpful to you. Let me know below. Our first question today comes from B. Kern, and uh, I'm asked, I've wondered about potting soil over the years. Why do I buy expensive soil when I have soil in my backyard? Very good question. We're gonna take a look at some potting soil. Potting soil is very loose and very filled with organic material. And the purpose of that is to provide some water retention, but also water drainage. If we come down here and look in my, in my native soil, I've got a lot of clay in there, and clay uh, doesn't drain well. And so if I just put a bunch of clay in here or some native soil that's not well draining, I'm gonna waterlog my plants in the pots here. It's gonna retain too much moisture. It's gonna compact. And if I use my clay, it's gonna turn into a rock when the summer comes. So the purpose of potting soil is twofold. Like I said, we're kind of playing a, a, a balancing game here. We want to retain enough moisture in the pot to feed the plant. At the same time, we want enough flow through of the water that it drains well and doesn't waterlog the roots. And this is important because in a small pot like that, you only have a small sample of soil here. Um, the roots have to live in just this little area here. They don't, they don't get to range out and go forage for resources, nor can they kind of self-correct. If you've got a low-lying, poorly draining area and you put a plant in the ground, it can kind of grow roots more closely to the surface and regulate its water intake. But in a pot, it's really up to whatever you put in there. The plant is, um, is at your mercy. And so we want to use a well-draining, loose uh, material that retains just enough moisture for the plant to survive, but uh, doesn't get waterlogged. So when you put a plant like that lemon tree in the native soil, it can go out and forage and spread its roots far and wide, and it can get the resources it needs, even if it's, the, if it's not the best soil over there, that, that's clay. But over the years, it can work into that clay if it needs to, or it can send roots out on the surface of the, of the top soil, which is about that thick. And that plant will survive there because it has the, the ability to spread out, but in a little container, it doesn't. Um, another thing is our containers often are, um, they suffer from more fluctuations of temperatures. You put a container in, in uh, you know, outside and, and let it grow in the sunlight and the temperature shifts, it's gonna evaporate more, more, more moisture quicker because, well, it's just a little bit of soil in a pot. It's exposed, the sides of that pot heat up and sometimes I've registered 110 degrees in potted soil and all that moisture in there is gonna wick right out. And so, um, you have, to, you have to be able to retain some of that moisture and loads of organic material in a potting mix is usually the answer. And that's what most potting mixes are heavy on. They're heavy on peat moss or compost or cocoa core. And uh, that helps to retain a little moisture and to fight off the, the negative effects of high temperature fluctuations and high moisture and, and dryness fluctuations. So a potting mix is always best for your potted plants. The next question comes from Upcycled Stuff. Hey Scott, do you ever let your radish go to seed to get the seed pods? I tried them for the first time and liked them better than the root. So yeah, um, sometimes I have in the past let them go to seed and I have enjoyed the harvested seed pods, especially from my Chinese red meat that I grew last year and um, I let some of those go to seed. I don't have any on hand <clears throat> that have gone to seed, but I have a very similar plant that performs the same way. This is bok choy, and you can see that all of this bok choy has gone to seed. Take a look on here. Wherever there was a flower, there is now a little seed pod. 
And if you're growing radishes, it grows exactly the same way. And these little seed pods will swell up and get real succulent, and they're a very nice delicacy. You can cook them in the stir fry, you can put them raw in salads, and you, get, you still get that radish flavor, a little bit of it, but it's more mellow. They're actually very good. This is bok choy. Mmm. That's a good little seed pod, even though they're little tiny things and not swollen yet. That's a good seed pod. So yes, you can grow radishes specifically for the seed pod. And you would do that especially successfully in the springtime. If you plant a radish in the springtime, it's going to likely bolt. And especially if you grow a winter type radish in the springtime, it's going to bolt and give you more seed pods. We have a question about that too. I have another question from Wanda Kelly. And Wanda's been on our Q&As before. She says, when is your favorite time to plant red meat radishes? She lives in zone 9A, or zone 8A, and received her seeds today. Well, um, that leads to a greater question about radishes in general, and many root crops in general, that uh, do some of them grow better in spring or fall? And the answer is yes. Um, chill hours, freezes, um, the time that the warmth returns in the spring all play on a radish's life cycle. Let me grab one of these Chinese red meats and I'll show you. This is a little tiny red, red meat radish. A little tiny, not because it's planted at the wrong time, but because it was planted too closely to one of its bigger brothers. But this will illustrate the point. Radishes have a life cycle, and the life cycle is, like all plants, uh, the goal of that plant is to reproduce. And to reproduce, it needs to grow up all of this foliage and then collect nutrition through photosynthesis and store it down in the root. And having stored it down in the root, the purpose of that is for the radish to make it through the winter. Um, once it's made it through the winter, it will wake up in the, in the, in the springtime with a, with a nice little stalk like we just looked at with those bok choys. And it will flower and bear seeds. And all of the, the, the stuff that's stored down here in this bulb will be used up. It will be used to produce seeds. And so what we want to do is we want to catch the radish at the point where all of those sugars and carbohydrates are stored down in the root. And that's when we want to, we want to uh, collect our radishes. And so some of these longer season radishes, like a Chinese red meat, are best grown in the fall. You put them in the ground, you wait till they bulb up, and then you pull them out. If you plant these in the, in the uh, springtime, what's going to happen is the longer growing season on these is going to cause the root to bulb up a little bit, but it's going to get warm and it's going to bolt and it's going to go to seed before you can really bulk up the root. And so, yeah, you want to make sure that when you're buying your radish seeds, you look and see, are these most appropriate for the spring or for the fall? Uh, many spring radishes are very fast growing radishes like the Saxa red, the Saxa II, um, the typical red globe radishes that are mature within 30 days. That way, uh, you know, they can grow up in the spring when you plant them early, and they won't have the warmth in just a month of growing to signal to the plant to bolt. But these kind of radishes, these are about uh, uh, two months to maturity, maybe even three. Uh, these you want to plant in the fall. These kinds of radishes are more appropriate. They'll set a bulb. Uh, anticipating the winter as the growing season slows down and they won't bolt and you can get a good bulb from them. Our next question comes from Sarah Acevedo in Orlando, Florida. Hey, my daughter lives near Orlando. Small world. Uh, zone 9B, like mine, I'm actually in Zone 9A, but I'm on the border, so very similar. Um, she has a question. What do I do with seeds that I bought last year that are now expired? Uh, are they still good or do I have to buy new ones? That's a good question, Sarah, especially for gardeners who are trying to be, be, uh, trying to be frugal. Um, expired seeds can be viable. In fact, um, some of these plants out here were five years old in the, in the seed form when I planted them. Uh, they had expired five years ago. Um, expired seeds can be grown if they were stored well. And the keys to storing seeds are that you need a dry space and you need a cool space. Heat and humidity are the destroyer of seed viability. So all of those radishes right there were grown with old seed that were expired. And the reason they came up was I had stored them in a cool, dry place. Actually, I have a closet under my stairway. And up on a shelf in that closet in the dark is where I store all my seeds. And uh, well, I've got more seeds than I can plant. So some of them are going to be expired. 
But the good news is um, scientists have actually germinated seeds that have been stored for thousands of years. And if you go and Google uh, oldest germinated seeds, you'll be amazed. Some of these seeds are carbon dated 10,000 years old. Uh, there are v many seeds that have been sprouted from uh, ancient times. And yeah, so it's all about storing them properly. So I would su suggest to store seeds, you keep them somewhere cool and somewhere that is dry. A lot of people store them in paper bags or little envelopes. Some people store them in Ziplocs. But uh, yeah, your paper seed packet that your seed came in is a perfect storage container. Just make sure you put it up somewhere cool and dry. Okay, the next question comes from Jessica Silva. And she asks, uh, do you change your bed frames and how often? She heard somebody say that slugs make their home in the sides of these bed frames. Yeah, the border of my garden is made of concrete, and I never change them. I don't ever intend to change these. In fact, these will be here long after I'm gone. So uh, the, the reason I chose the concrete was just because I was tired of changing out wooden garden borders. Um, yes, it's true that slugs will uh, get into the cracks and make their homes in, in cracks like that. Slugs, lizards, geckos, snakes, all kinds of pests. And uh, I've had uh, creatures live down in these holes as well when I'm not planting in them. But the benefit is, is I can come and flame weed my garden and not worry about charring or burning my borders. They're not gonna rot away and they're just permanent. I love these things. So uh, the, the issue with the slugs, it's gonna be the same whether I have concrete or wood and changing them's not really gonna help because they're living in between the soil and the border. Uh, the thing you're going to find is that slugs are easy to treat. Snails and mollusks and things like that, it's easy to treat. Just get some iron phosphate pellets, a natural product, spread it in your garden, or make a beer trap and you won't have any trouble. But I do have some wooden borders. Let me show you those. Okay, so this is one of my small little beds. It's currently in transition right now, letting it rest until the spring. But that's a 2 by 12 board that the sides are made out of. That's treated lumber, and I don't mind treated lumber. Uh, they don't treat lumber with the same toxins that they used to. And uh, you can get some uh, two by 12s fairly cheaply and just make you a border like this. Now, treated or not, uh, they're still gonna rot. This treated lumber I expect to last me five to six years and then I'll start seeing significant rot. So uh, I'm gonna have to replace it at some point. And that's the downside. And you, the people might ask, well, as it rots, won't rotting wood harbor pests? Yes, a little bit, but most of those pests are not pests to your plants in your garden. They're wood loving. Um, when I had my garden beds on the other side of my yard and I had uh, two by 12 borders on those, when they started to rot and I replaced the wood, when I pulled them up, what I found in that wood was wood boring beetles and beetle larva. Well, they're not gonna mess with your plant. They're just destroying your garden border. So that's not a big deal to me. The, bo the, the slugs and snails will get down in between the border and the soil but that's gonna happen with whatever kind of border you use. You just treat for slugs. I had a couple of compost questions I wanna address. Uh, Lynette Ledoux says, regarding the compost pile, what's your advice on chopping up spent garden plants before throwing them into the compost bin? Well, that always helps. Um, I have been known to put whole plants in my compost pile. This was a radish I used in my aborted attempt to make this video earlier in which I had no audio. Um, I just throw it in whole. Uh, yeah, it's going to take longer to, to, to uh, break down, and uh, that doesn't matter to me. I'm on a long-term schedule with my compost. I don't need it, but maybe twice, maybe three times a year. And so it doesn't bother me throwing a whole plant in there. What's going to happen is that plant's going to desiccate, uh, the water's going to evaporate out of it, and the bacteria will go, go to work on it just fine. But if you need fast com compost, then you'll want to chop your stuff up uh, as small as you can get it, either a cheap wood chipper or lay it on the ground and run it up with your lawnmower. And that'll shred the contents of your pile. And that will give more surface area for the bacteria to go to work on the material. And it's not a lot of more surface area. It's, you know, the width of a leaf, but a lot of that, um, that will actually help. But sometimes I do chop up my compost with a machete. I just come and take a few whacks at it whenever I have the opportunity and it makes me feel better but it will, it will speed up your compost a bit if you uh, start off with small shredded things 
and not big giant plants. Okay, I have one more compost question from Terry Berg. Terry asks, does compost heat up in the winter months? Uh, compost actually does heat up in the winter months, but not as hot as in the summer. Right now, my compost is ambient temperature. It's uh, about 58 degrees, it's cold. It's not really working much. And the reason for that is I don't have a real bulky pile right now. What I've got in there is not enough to insulate the core of my compost pile. What causes the compost pile to heat up is the, endo, the exothermic activity of the bacteria that are down in there breaking up your plant material, and they put off heat. Well, uh, just like us, if the ambient temperatures are real cold, we slow down. So does the bacteria, and the bacteria can't thrive in cold temperatures as well. It's still going on down there, and there's other things going on too, like fungal breakdown. The fungi in here are working in the cold weather to break down uh, my compost. But yeah, it will heat up, especially if you get a good balance of nitrogen to carbon. It'll heat up and you'll be surprised. Some people have even heated their water with giant compost piles. They're, they'll run pipe through there and let the, the thermal energy of that compost pile transfer the water in the pipes and they'll have uh, uh, you know, at least a little bit of warm water. I, I don't get a compost pile to burn that hot in the wintertime. It's just too, uh, too cold and my compost piles are not that big, and I'm not adding a lot of new mass to it to uh, really kickstart a, a burn. But I have had my compost pile in the winter up into the 120s, uh, maybe even pushing 130, which is a pretty good burn. But in the summertime, when the ambient temperature is not working against the little guys down here, the bacteria doing their job, uh, in the summertime, I get my pile up to 150, uh, almost 160. So. Yeah, it's going to slow down a little bit, but it's still going to rot down. If you just leave it there, it will eventually rot down. Okay, we've got another question from Arnulfo Riojas. Arnulfo says, uh, I heard in other videos that you should use non-chlorinated water or water from the rain on your gardens. Is this the truth, especially for compost? Uh, thanks in advance. Yeah, um, it is true that you should use non-chlorinated water. All those plants back there, though, have never had any water applied to them by me that wasn't out of my water hose, unless it rained. I pretty much use city water exclusively. This one goes to the garden, this one goes to the compost pile, and uh, I personally haven't had any problems with it. Um, you know, but then again, I haven't, I haven't used uh, non-chlorinated water and done a side-by-side -side study. So when I get my rain catchment system, perhaps I'll notice that study, and if I do, I'll I'll notice the results and I'll comment on that. Here's the problem. Uh, chlorine kills plants. Chlorine in our water and all the other additives they add uh, can uh, harm your soil biology. Uh, but the issue isn't really a big deal unless you're just trying to, you know, like highly tweak and highly improve your gardening methodologies. Um, if you can drink the water that comes out of the tap, then you can put that water in your garden. Yes, it's going to knock the bacteria back a little bit, but bacteria are amazing creatures. They multiply in record time, in blinding time. By the time you've killed off 20% of your bacteria population with chlorinated tap water, the next day, they're going to pop right back. There's just no reason to, to be too concerned about it. So you can use chlorinated water, although rainwater is the best, and my plans for my barrels over by my compost bin is uh, to make a rain catchment system. Now I have a, a new roof right there, and I'm not getting a lot of gravel off that roof. Now is the time for me to make a rain catchment system. And yes, that will be better. You can always tell when you get a fresh rain and it hadn't rained in a while, your, your plants just perk up. While if you just water them, they just kind of they, they just kind of improve slowly. So yeah, you can use tap water. The question is, should you? That's a whole nother debate. Okay, another question comes from Chastity Tucker, and she asks, have you considered winter sowing method for starting seeds? Um, no. In fact, Chastity, I didn't even know about the winter sowing method until I went and looked at your channel. Uh, Chastity has a good channel. Uh, the sowing method she's talking about is kind of how you make a miniature greenhouse out of a jug or a milk jug or a big two liter water jug. You cut it in half, but leave a hinge open that up, put some soil in the bottom, put some drainage holes in the bottom, uh, plant your seeds in there, water it in, close it up and tape it up so that you've got a little sealed environment. You put that outside and it acts like a cold frame 
and you can start your seeds that way without going to the effort of getting uh, seed starting lights, heat mats, and all that stuff that is required for beginning seeds indoors. Um, I haven't tried it, but I've checked out her channel, and I think you should too. Go check out Chastity Tucker's channel. I'll link it down in the, in the comments below. Look at the carnage back here. Well, my final question comes from actually some of my church family. And, uh, yeah, we cleared this area. This area was cleared of three, actually two large Bradford pear trees that had been here nearly, nearly 30 years, and the stump of the third one. And, uh, well, I've got all this space now. My son and I decided we're going to do some apple trees. And so everywhere I've put a stake in here is my tentative plan to have four apple trees in this area and two over on my fence, espaliered across the fence, and that's a pruning method we'll get into. Um, and the question was, what varieties did I choose? After all, I live in the subtropics. Can you grow apple, apples in the tropics and the subtropics? Uh, yes, you can. We found Cuffel Creek Nursery, and they have apples growing in their test farm in Uganda. And so they've published a list of varieties that are suitable for a place like this, uh, Zone 9A on the Texas coast. And so the varieties we chose are the Anna, which is uh, a good variety for heat. Uh, we chose the Dorset, which is a companion to the Anna. You need those two together to pollinate one another. I chose a Fuji, um, and I'm not going to remember them all. Shell of Alabama, I chose one called the Reverend something or other, which was developed here in the Houston area. And I'll put all those descriptions in the titles here so you can see them. And I chose one other that we're going to grow, uh, some sort of a Dixie Red. But these four, uh, these six varieties of apples are supposed to do well here. And uh, yeah, well, if you want to learn how to grow apples and see the progress, I'll build a fruit tree playlist. And I'll drop that down in my channel so that you can follow along over the years. Growing trees and fruit trees is a lengthy process. It's not an overnight thing or it's not a one season thing. Uh, we're going to be growing these apples for uh, at least two to five years before we see significant fruit and we're going to be pruning them, training them, caring for them. Um, and if you want to know how to do that, follow our channel and please subscribe. So that's the plan for over here. And that's the, those are the varieties we're going to grow. So there's question and answer episode 15. Thank you for your questions. If you have any questions about gardening, especially in a backyard suburban context like mine, drop a question down in the comment section. And if I think I can answer it honestly, I will. A lot of questions I can't answer. I'm not a master gardener. I'm not a farmer or a homesteader. I'm not, a, I'm not even a gardening expert, really. Um, I just know what I've done and learned and what works for me in my context. And I've picked up some things over the years and I like to share them, what works for me and what seems to be the right way to garden in my context. And that's always key. In your context, gardening might look different. Um, so yeah, that's it, question and answer 15. Subscribe to our channel if you haven't already, we'd really appreciate it. We're trying to reach that 100,000 mark this spring, and I think we'll get there. Like us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, and we'll talk to you next time. Happy gardening to you. Bye-bye.